What's that? Uh, I don't have to wear a mask. Oh. Hey guys, and welcome back to Latter Day Divers, where we dive into the words of ancient and modern prophets. My name is Will Perez, and thanks for being on my channel. Today I'm excited to go over some unique context and build up to Ether chapter 12, one of our favorite chapters in the Book of Mormon. So for today's dive, I want to expound on an idea that I latched onto, presented by Adam Miller in his book, Rube Goldberg Machines. It's a compilation of essays. He's an LDS author, theologian. Uh, here, check it out. Look up Rube Goldberg Machine. It's a cool phrase if you don't know it. But he examines Ether 12 uh, in a way I've never considered before and presents Moroni's stylistic choices as an author in a way that builds and gives meaning to the entire chapter 12 composition. The premise is this. As a whole, Ether 12 stages the difference between two forms of power. One is divine, one is human. One is rooted in a confession of weakness, one is grounded in a pretension to strength. So let's explore this together. I hope that I can get this to make sense. Thank you for being on the channel. Uh, like, subscribe, share, and if you're ready, let's dive. So two blasts of dive alarm, password, dive, dive. Dive, dive. So the prophet Ether is first introduced in Ether chapter 11, verse 23, and essentially is born a political prisoner. He's the grandson of a Jaredite king. His father, Coriantor, had spent most of his days, his life, in captivity. And his grandfather was a moron and did that which was wicked in the sight of the Lord. I'm sorry. His grandfather was named Moron and did that which was wicked in the sight of the Lord all his days. I've heard it both ways. So that's where Ether's coming to us from. Then we read in chapter 12 that the days of Ether were in the days of Coriantumr. And Coriantumr was king over all the land. So we've got this foil, this contrast set up here. On one hand, we've got a king over all the land. And on the other hand, we've got a political prisoner. And Ether was a prophet of the Lord. Wherefore, Ether came forth in the days of Coriantumr and began to prophesy unto the people. For he could not be restrained because of the spirit of the Lord which was in him. Again, let's review this contrast. Ether, prisoner prophet, Coriantumr, king over all the land with armies at his disposal. So we read that Ether came forth in the days of Coriantumr and could not be restrained. So obviously this refers to him having so much to say through the spirit and being out and about bearing testimony that uh, he could not be kept quiet. But Miller also points out the political overtones of these phrases. Remember that Ether's father and grandfather were prisoners and had their children in captivity? So how is Ether all of a sudden free to roam around and preach? When we read that he came forth, it may be indicative of him coming forth out of captivity. And when we read that he could not be restrained, it may be a reference to how Ether, filled with the Spirit, could not be confined to captivity like his father and grandfather before him. The weakness of a prisoner turned prophet is opposed to the strength of a mighty man. God's word challenges Coriantumr's sword. So now that we understand this background and context and this contrast, it's really fascinating to see how, after going into how faith is a prerequisite for an experience with Christ, and partaking of the heavenly gift and seeing a more excellent way, Moroni then uses four specific examples of faith. And like the ether coriantumr contrast he just set up, they all have to do with the Lord's power being manifest among prisoner prophets. First, he gives the example of Alma and Amulek, who, after a horrible ordeal through faith, caused the prison walls to tumble to the earth. Second, we have Nephi and Lehi, who by faith were delivered out of bondage and death by fire, and instead become an instrument in the Lord's hands in having the Lamanites become baptized by fire and by the Holy Ghost. Third, we have Ammon and his brethren, who we know at one point were imprisoned and beaten and stripped, and by faith overcome this, are delivered, and become instruments in converting a nation to the Lord. Lastly, we have the three Nephites, who are delivered from the prison of death, among many other man-made confinements that could not hold them. In each of these examples, Moroni stages a confrontation between the strong power of the sword, the power of death and imprisonment, and the weak power of the prophetic word. The difference between Coriantumr and Ether is organized around the difference between the power of the sword to impose confinement and the power of the word to liberate the prisoner. 
I believe these carefully crafted contrasts and examples illustrate the principle repeated all over scripture, that God has called the weak things of the world to confound the mighty, and that he has chosen the weak things, those that are unlearned and despised, to thresh the nations by the power of his spirit. And I can't think of more beautiful imagery and context to set the stage for what Moroni is going to record later on in chapter 12. The truth that if we humble ourselves and come unto Christ in weakness, he will make weak things become strong unto us. When we in faith accept and confess our weakness, the veil is rent in our lives. This is the power of the word. Ether cried repentance unto the people from the morning until the going down of the sun, but we read that they did not believe his words because they saw them not. The sword, the pride of men, does not want to acknowledge its weakness, does not want to confess that there are things it cannot see on its own. And yet Moroni reminds us that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Faith faithfully acknowledges our weakness. Disbelief actively veils it. Where the power of the word moves us to confess the presence of a veil, the power of the sword plays itself out as an attempt to deny any such limitation to our power or vision. As we read later in the chapter, the key, however, is to see that the weakness that confronts Moroni is, in the end, nothing other than a manifestation of God's saving strength. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our dive for today. I hope that going through the depth of just the composition of Ether 12 will add depth and insight to your study of chapter 12 and allow the Spirit to teach you what you need to learn as you seek deliverance from whatever ails you in today's world and in your life. Thank you for being on the channel, for helping it grow. Please like, subscribe, share. Let me know below, did this even make sense? Like, did what did you hear Will Perez say? Or was I just blah, 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 you know? And uh, lastly, what else do you learn? What do you see? What do you like? And what do you want to learn about in the future? You're awesome. Thanks for diving with me today. Hope to see you next time on Latter-day Divers.